Good morning, and thanks for joining us for State of Texas In Depth. I'm Erin Cargyle, in for Josh Hinkle. This week, we take a look at the attempt to rehab an image of the uh, state's cancer research fund after scandal. But first, in a couple of days, the Texas legislature will be officially full. Several newly elected state representatives, as well as a new state senator, will take their oaths of office. They were all voted in special elections. And this week, Robert Hadlock spoke with state representative elect John Sirier. He represents Bastrop, Lee, Caldwell, Gonzales, and Carnes counties. But despite living in Lockhart, he owns a business in Austin and commuted here for a decade and a half. You live in Lockhart and, and will be driving up here every day. You see the traffic problems firsthand. And uh, what are some of the solutions that you think you might have? Yeah, I was a former county commissioner in Caldwell County. Uh, my wife, Rochelle, and I have lived in uh, Lockhart for 14 years. So, yes, we absolutely have seen a lot of transformation, not, uh, transformation not only in uh, Caldwell County, but, of course, Central Texas in general. And uh, we were very fortunate in Caldwell County when I was a commissioner. We had the opening of SH-130 through the, right through the center of uh, Caldwell County. And so transportation, economic development has been key for our county. And with, um, you know, the growth that we're seeing from urban sprawl, uh, with uh, the Austin growth, and in District 17 in general, from Lee, Bastrop County, Caldwell County, the growth that we're experiencing from that urban sprawl, the transportation is so key, it's so vital for us. Over 64% of the uh, residents in our county, uh, for their business, have to go leave uh, Caldwell County to, uh, for their placement of work. So. Having uh, safe roads, having quality roads is uh, very important to us. I gather you're for more funding for highways in Texas. Yes, I am. I was a member of uh, uh, CAMPO, our Capital Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. I was on their policy board for five years uh, when Caldwell County first got brought into it, which also represents Bastrop County in our district. And uh, being on that board and experiencing that and realizing the, how funding is so tight, with the amount of growth that we're experiencing and the limited funds that we have, transportation is so key. And it's not just for uh, roads of, of, of moving people, but it's also just the safety factor of it as well. What's your position on expanding toll roads in Texas? You know, toll roads, uh, you know, for Caldwell County, I would have to say um, we had a, um, you know, with the opportunity of having SH 130. Um, uh, going back to a safety aspect of it, traveling on it for 10 years of having uh, uh, no uh, divided highway, no shoulders, uh, just from a safety aspect of it, I'm, I feel like we're very fortunate to have the, uh, the SH-130. Uh, for expansion of toll roads, it's, um, I think the policy right now is to keep you know, the uh, non-toll roads, to still have the non-toll roads with those uh, new toll roads are not creating toll roads on existing roads. Uh, I think that policy is fair, uh, but also too, we know there's, we need a mechanism to be able to keep up with, uh, with the future of our transportation needs. Water is a huge issue in your district and that was a big contention in the campaign. Tell us your stance on water rights here in the state. Yeah, water is uh, extremely important. We're, we're blessed in uh, District 17 to have water throughout all, all five counties. Um, you know, it is a big issue in this legislative session. And uh, having that local control and being able to protect our water is extremely important to us. It's extremely important to our uh, constituents in District 17 and the people that I represent and will continue to, to focus on protecting our water and protecting our water rights and the quality of life for our future generations. You have been very active in uh, public education uh, down in Lockhart. And I want to get your thoughts on school finance, uh, how Texas should approach the issue. The session in 2011 when funding was cut and brought back, which many, uh, many agencies had to do the same. Totally get that during the recession. But I would say that, um, you know, uh, being there in Lockhart, Caldwell County, and then you look at all, all uh, five of these counties from Lee, Bastrop County, Carnes, Gonzales, public education is so critical for our five rural counties. So. Uh, I think it's very important that, uh, you know, throwing money at something is not, not the solution for everything, but uh, having the proper finances and making sure that we have the, the, the best teachers and the best schools for our children is uh, extremely important to us and it's very important for these uh, five rural counties. You were uh, right in the middle of the thick of the action there during the Bastrop uh, complex fires and fire danger remains critical in our area because of the drought. 
Uh, anything on the legislative calendar that uh, gets your attention in terms of fire safety in Texas, especially in your district? Yes, in uh, 2011, uh, the Labor Day weekend fires in those weeks, we also had Caldwell County fires. Uh, there was, uh, you know, obviously the Bastrop Complex fires was devastating. A lot of our resources went to that. But what we saw in Caldwell County and in, in Bastrop County, the uh, how much our volunteer fire departments, again, being in rural counties, how much they mean to us and mean to our community and our first line of defense. Uh, just already sat in, a, uh, even though I'm not sworn in yet, already sat in one of our House Committee uh, on, on uh, Agriculture and Livestock. We heard about uh, funding for volunteer fire departments, and I think things like that are definitely going to perk our interest in something that's so critical for our communities. Uh, with the droughts from 2008 and then, of course, then in 2011, there's a lot of still dead timber around. The, uh, the chances of that fire happening again are still out there and something that we need to be aware of. Will you be pushing for more money for rural uh, volunteer fire districts? I'll be definitely looking for that and, and uh, helping to support them and listening to our, uh, our fire departments and our volunteer fire departments and our paid fire departments and seeing what their needs are because uh, you know, living in those communities, uh, those are, uh, those are our, our first line of defense for these wildfires. As you well know, Carnes County is a, a magnet for oil production right now, and the price of oil is stuck at around fifty dollars. Uh, are there big concerns uh, among your constituents about uh, losing jobs in Carnes County because of that? Yeah, it's actually important. Oil and gas. We are blessed again uh, in in District 17, all five counties with oil and gas. Now, Carnes being, I believe, the number one producer of oil and gas out of the 254 counties in the state of Texas. So. Obviously, it's a lifeline for them, but also the lifeline for the state of Texas. Uh, spent spent s several meetings with the uh, commissioner's court during the election, during this process. Obviously, uh, well in tune with Caldwell County's needs of oil and gas. Uh, many of us look at the uh, Eagle for Shell. No question, uh, even years ago, three years ago, when even when the boom was just starting to get at its peak, looking at diversification and when the downturn was going to happen. So it's not like it's a huge shock that there might be a downturn or there's a possibility that that things may change. Uh, the counties have been preparing for that. The commissioner's courts have been preparing for that for these days. Uh, in Carnes, they feel like that uh, uh, things are going to be okay. Now, there's not new uh, oil wells being drilled, but the, uh, the, what's being produced is still, even at that dollar amount, uh, price for barrel, is still okay and it's still a producing asset. So, um, you know, like I said, years before this, they have been preparing for this, uh, you know, for what, what may happen, and, and uh, we'll continue to, to be smart about what we're doing and policies. Are you hearing complaints in Carnes County and perhaps Lee County about uh, the big trucks, oil trucks that go through and damage the roads and a lot of potholes uh, in a lot of places? Uh, what's your plan to fix that? No, that's a great, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was very obvious making several trips down to Carnes County, going through Gonzales County, too, as well. You know, it's one thing um, we all that live in the in the counties and on county roads we're used to county roads not maybe not being up to speed and things like that. But uh, when you're driving on a state highway and you about take off the front end of your pickup truck as you're driving down the highway, you know there's problems. Uh, there is no doubt anybody that's traveled through that area of Gonzales and Carnes County realize the you know the blessing that we have and the revenues that we've been generating out of those counties. Uh, to produce that go towards our, 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 our funds need to come back to help, help uh, uh, protect and uh, actually uh, fix and maintain those road systems. What's your position on providing some property tax relief for your constituents? No, I'm excited. I'm excited about the opportunity to participate in that. I think that's a, uh, it's great that the Senate and the House is looking at that and I'll be all for that. That was Robert Hadlock reporting. In addition to Representative Syria's swearing in, three other lawmakers will take their oath. Senator-elect Jose Menendez and Representative-elect Diego Bernal of San Antonio, as well as Representative-elect Leighton Schuber, whose district includes Fayette County. The House Parliamentarian's office tell us the swearing in will take place on Tuesday around noon. So what's next for the state's fund dedicated to finding a cure for cancer? Officials at the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas say their grant funding scandal is behind them. But a new crop of conservative lawmakers create a new challenge. We take a deeper look coming up on State of Texas In Depth.
Welcome back to State of Texas in depth. The state's Cancer Prevention and Research Institute is trying to rebuild its image, saying it's regained the public's confidence after a scandal tied to grant awards. But CPRIT's leaders face a new generation of conservative lawmakers who are questioning whether the state should even be in the cancer fighting business. Patients who have benefited from the institution's grants tell Alana Rocha with our reporting partner, the Texas Tribune, they cannot imagine life without it. Maybe gorgeous, even though it's messy, it's still gorgeous. <laughs> Dana Anderson is used to taking care of others. Nearly a dozen years ago, she and her husband started the Lighthouse, a ministry for troubled youths in Eagle Lake, 70 miles west of Houston. Then, about a year ago, she found herself needing help. My life stopped when they said you had breast cancer. Anderson contacted the Rose, a nonprofit breast health care organization in southeast Texas, to get a free mammogram that led to her diagnosis. Their encouragement was amazing, and it did keep you going. They were there to tell you, I will stand with you, I will pray for you. The Rose, with the help of grant money from the state's Cancer Prevention and Research Institute, supported her through the diagnosis and months of treatments, both emotionally and financially. That is the big key and the big hook with CPRIT funding, is that we're able to, to provide all of those services up to the diagnosis for women. In 2007, Texas voters approved the creation of CPRIT, a state agency with a $3 billion budget to fund cancer research and prevention. But in 2012, an oversight committee disclosed that the agency had approved an $11 million grant without a proper review. It became a, 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 a growing story and uh, there was a resulting loss of confidence in our processes uh, by key members of the legislature. At the end of 2012, Wayne Roberts was brought in as CPRIT's interim CEO to stabilize the agency. He worked with lawmakers to make sure CPRIT, whose grant-making powers were temporarily suspended, had a path forward. Today, Roberts touts CPRIT's increased transparency and accountability. I just think that, that uh, there has been a lot of comfort with, with where we are. It is attracting the best and the brightest, and um, you know we, got it. we have a job to do, and I want us to make sure we finish that job. State Representative Jim Keffer, who sponsored the 2007 House bill that helped create CPRIT, is confident in the agency's current operations. But some across the rotunda are not as sure. Uh, I wasn't around when CPRIT was passed. I have my own concerns as to how involved the state should be in funding cancer research. Senate Health and Human Services Committee Chairman Charles Schwartner has filed a bill that would require CPRIT develop a plan to be self-sufficient financially by 2021. Keffer agrees the agency needs to be forward-thinking, but worries Schwartner's legislation is premature, with more than $1.5 billion still left to award. I know we disagree on the state's role of cancer research and prevention, uh, but uh, certainly I think he uh, understands the will of the people. As for Dana Anderson, who now awaits breast reconstruction surgery, she says she's living proof the state's investment is worth it. She could focus on her health without putting a financial burden on her family. So it's a hope program to me. It says my life matters. It says that another person's life matters enough to invest in something that is really pretty rampant in today's world. In Eagle Lake, this is Alana Rocha reporting for the Texas Tribune. In addition to legislation about CPRET, lawmakers will also look at other ways to improve care. A bill filed this week in the Texas Senate could make it easier for terminally ill patients to get access to potentially life-saving medication. The Andrea Sloan Right to Try Act would eliminate the 30-day waiting period at the Food and Drug Administration after a pharmaceutical company approves a patient for an experimental medication. This legislation is already passed in five states and is being considered in an additional 26 states. The Texas legislation is named for Austin attorney Andrea Sloan, who battled ovarian cancer and waited several months for an experimental drug doctors believe could extend her life. She passed away last year. 
Two state lawmakers are fighting against a deadly disease, but not by creating laws. A couple of weeks back, we showed you how Representatives Kyle Cassell and Ken King formed KK125. The nonprofit helps fund research for ovarian cancer. King and Cassell both lost their mothers to the disease not long after taking office. My mother, Linda, was the glue that held our family together. She did everything for everyone. I believe my mother is um, looking down on me and our little group and is extremely proud. The name KK125 comes from the lawmaker's initials and the only blood test out there that can detect ovarian cancer early. It's called CA125, and the lawmakers plan to file a bill that could help women get screened on a regular basis and have it covered by insurance. Thank you for joining us for State of Texas In-Depth. You can join us every Sunday morning in the 8.30 half hour for a broader look at Texas politics. We're back in two minutes with more news and weather, and stay tuned for Meet the Press coming up at 9.